It's pretty crazy. It's a shit show. It's a pretty tough time. Is Fiat enabling this war? It is heavily controlled by the fabric of society, which is Fiat. So it's like the oxygen we breathe is the Fiat currency that we operate on. And we don't stop to question how that system is designed, how that system is operating, whether it's for my benefit or not, whether it's enslaving me or not, whether it's serving a good purpose or not. We just take it for granted. You are going to be getting used to living an endless war because that's what the globalist powers want. 70% of people in Israel are in favor of that war. The state have made them feel like war is the best option. On a Bitcoin standard, we may not have central banks. The power that the banks and the central banks hold will decrease. Bitcoin startups have to be much more efficient and much more productive and much better better at what they do than normal startups. Good and kindness exists in the world, starting to see the broken incentive structure, the way that doctors are behaving because of the incentive structures that they have towards the government, towards the Ministry of Health, towards the World Health Organization. Hi, Fred. How are you doing? Everything fine on your end? Everything is great on my end. I mean, considering the situation and where I live, it's, I'm all good. I'm fine. Oh, where, where do you live? Is, uh... I live in Israel. Oh, man, I didn't know that. How, how, how is it uh, over there right now? It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's a shit show. It's a pretty tough time for people. Yeah, quite difficult for people who choose to live here and, uh, and, and are aware and quite awake to everything that's going on in the world and and around here. Uh, it's not easy because, um, yeah, you see a lot, you understand probably things that they're not saying, but they're doing, um, and you're not falling to the propaganda, so you can see through it, and it's pretty difficult, I mean, I, I am fine because I do a lot of work to kind of stabilize myself and and my close environment. But many people around me are, yeah, suffering from various uh, implications of this war. This leads me uh, perfectly actually to my first question. Is, is fear enabling this war? Do you see it as uh, something that is coming from fear or is war something human made? Well... Fiat is human made and uh and and the human nature if it is not contained and if it is not uh, I think if if you don't as a human if you don't do work to try to improve yourself all the time it's very easy to be dragged down to the negative side of being a human with all the with all the incentives that you get out of doing things that are negative in life um, and unfortunately i think that the modern society has been designed in such a way that the incentive structure for humans today is such that you get incentivized for doing things that are probably not good for humanity and are better for corporations or for governments or for you know, state control or even globalist organizations. And I think that most of the people that are taking part in this uh, negative um, trajectory for humanity are doing so while they are not bad people or they don't mean uh, any evil intent or they don't have an nefarious goal behind how they behave or what they do. Most people, I would say, from what I'm seeing, from what I'm researching and learning, they're simply not engaged in any um, sophisticated, uh, deep conversation with themselves, firstly, and with the world, secondly, about the implications of what they do and how they behave in the world. And they don't stop to think about the ripple effect that their existence has on the rest of humanity. And so when you live like that, in a way such, 
a little bit like an automatic pilot, right? You just operate without really thinking, without really, I mean, you can think, but you think about the easy things in life. You don't stop to think about the harder things in life. Then it's very easy for you to fall prey to the traps that the modern matrix puts in front of you, right? You, you have an incentive to go work for someone. You have an incentive to be a good citizen, to pay taxes, to participate in society in such a way that you will be a compliant citizen, that um, you, know, you won't rock the boat too much and create too much fuss because society would expect you to behave a certain way. So there is an incentive for you to be aligned with society, with the state, with the government, uh, and with corporations. And, and so when you're so far down in the ladder of decision-making and actually uh, making, creating any significant changes, you're so far down the ladder that you don't really make a, a real impact or a real difference in the world that you know, that you can see tomorrow morning, you'll say, oh, I'll change something small in my life that will create a significant change and therefore I'll do it. Like, it's really hard to create a, a, a significant change immediately. And so I think that it's way easier to just continue rolling with life the way they're designed, the way it's designed without asking questions, without trying to change things. Um, as I said, not, not from a nefarious place, but just from an easier place, from a place of convenience. And therefore, you become, you know, just a small pawn on the chess game of the matrix. And that matrix, the way I see it, is heavily um, controlled by uh, the, the fabric of society, which is fiat. So it's like the oxygen we breathe is the fiat currency that we operate on and we don't stop to question how that system is designed, how that system is operating, whether it's for my benefit or not, whether it's enslaving me or not, whether it's you know serving a good purpose or not. We just take it for granted. And just like the air we breathe, it's the money we use, right? It's, it's that very, very basic fabric of life that is fiat. And so when we take it for granted, you know, so if, if you take that as a first principle, as a basic assumption that everyone runs on the same oxygen, the same fiat without questioning anything, and fiat, we know there is an equation that it incentivizes wars because of the, you know, the, the military industrial complex and the money that is being made when you go out to war, when you conquer a land or an area, but also when you have property rights over other areas. And then after a war, when you have to rebuild, then you also get the fiat machine working because you need more money to justify the building after you ruin something. So the whole, the whole system, the whole structure is incentivized in such a way that war is like in a way, something that stimulates the economy and it's a good thing. And so, I mean, a good thing. People know war is not a good thing, but they, they, they are um, naturally incentivized to go with the flow and to enable it because in the end of the day, it's, there are a lot of incentives to do it. And so, yeah, so, you know, to cut a long story short, I think that by taking fiat for granted we also have grown to take wars for granted and just like julian assange said you are going to be getting used to living an endless war because that's what the globalist powers want they want you to kind of think that it's normal to live an endless war and when there is no war that is like your that is like the special time, but you know, your your normal life will be accompanied by some kind of a battle, some kind of a war, and I think many people got used to it. It's not like we want wars; people know they don't want war, but when it's here or when it's coming, they are 
eating all the baits and falling for all the traps and un- believing all the excuses that they're being given for why this war is essential, for why now we have to, you know, do this or participate in this and why they also have to sacrifice a lot of things in their lives to make it happen. And, and they do. And so, yeah, I think, you know, if you look at the statistics now in Israel, we are, everyone knows, you know, we're like at the cusp of, uh, perhaps breaking another war with, uh, Iran or in the North of Lebanon and North, sorry, North of Israel with the South of Lebanon, right on the border there with Hezbollah forces that are, um, that are funded by Iran. So this could be a break of, uh, another, um, battle in this third world war that we're living right now, I I just saw a statistic that is staggering for me that around about, don't catch me on the exact number, but around about 70% of people in Israel are in favor of that war, of, you know, launching that battle with Hezbollah. And you think about it, it's like 70% or maybe even more. It's like most of the people in Israel are actually waging war where when a lot of the people in that area in the north of Israel are uprooted from their homes for about eight months or nine months, 10 months, they don't have a normal life. They are living in hotels or they're living in, you know, a relative's house or whatever. And their life is completely upside down. And still they're like, yeah, bring on the war. Why? Because they feel unsafe and because the government and the, and the state have made them feel like war is the best option. And that's ridiculous in my eyes. And it's not like I don't want Israel to protect itself. I live here, right? I want protection. But I, you know, I, I look at it from a more zoomed out perspective of this whole war and who does it serve and why it's happening. And yeah, so it's it's very difficult and it's a very complex conflict and it's very hard to be deterministic about this whole situation. Um, I have a lot of compassion for people on all sides uh, that are being hurt from this conflict. And there are many atrocities that are being done at the moment in the name of this holy war. Um, so it's very sad and it's very hard to be living in such a situation, such a place. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry that that's the opening for my interview, but <laughs> this is rea- This is the reality I live in. I, th- I think it's a great opening actually for a Bitcoin conversation because it shows for me the the fiat problem. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if, if we can stop wars with a Bitcoin standard, but we can get into this a little later. Um, what I hear a lot when we talk about wars and when we talk about uh, uh, things like that, um, why people do that or why is it causing or what's the real reason for, for, for war is for me like um, when, when there's a leader uh, in a country uh, and there is a war coming out, uh, the people I think are more uh, likely to follow this leader in a, in a catastrophic situation because they are fearful. They, they, they want protection. They want a exactly. strong leader. And for, for me, I, I'm, I'm asking myself or, or like, I'm asking you the question, do you think the real purpose of a war is just to keep that feared uh, system or that, that bigger system alive? Because otherwise people will like, ah. Oh, when when you feel safe, you, you have a different kind of a life. You you ask different questions. Yeah, see, you're you're asking that uh, to a person that lives in Israel and has a slightly different view than most people in Israel, right? I have a, a different view, and I I'm embracing that, be, and I'm standing behind my view because of my experience in the army. Uh, I say served in the army 25 years ago and because of the role that I had and what I've done and what I've seen. And so my view about um, this specific war and many other wars in the history of Israel is that they are designed to keep people in a constant state of fear in a constant state of trauma, 
it's like even more than fear it's trauma because with fear yeah you can get a lot down done but when you actually inflict trauma on a person you have a very significant shock time frame after you You do a certain event, and you, you may have heard about the movie or the book, "The Shock Doctrine" by uh, Naomi, Naomi Wolf, I think her name is. Um, it's, a, it's a really stunning book and, and movie which I recommend people to see if they have a strong stomach, because it's a tough one, but it basically shows you how the U.S. has uh, you know, started different types of wars and And um, coups in, in different places around the world, coup d'etats, right, to take over the establishment in a certain country uh, by a tactic of a shock doctrine. You come into the country and you create some kind of event or emergency or um, a very shattering event that will create a shock with the uh, society with the population in that country and during that shock period people will be so overwhelmed that they will not think straight and they will essentially be a lot more prone to almost anything that the establishment or the government wants to do in that country it will be very hard for them to resist because almost anything that the government or the state would do at that stage would be you portrayed as we're helping you or we're helping solve that problem that we now have. And so when you create that cycle of problem reaction solution or that shock that will be followed by, you know, a soothing, calming down period of the society and then introduction of a solution to solve that problem that just happened, then you are, um, in a way, like um, Stockholm syndrome when you have a uh, you know uh, uh, someone that goes into um, uh, someone that has been kidnapped and the kidnapper is then being portrayed by the good guy because he's now helping you so it's a little bit like that like the state is oftentimes the factor that had started initiated or enabled that crisis to happen to begin with and And then the people fall prey to that, not seeing that the state has anything to do with that, but thinking that, oh, it's just happened by some coincidence or, you know, bad intent or malintent of someone from the outside, or it has nothing to do with our beloved, you know, government or state. They would never do this to us. And they will embrace the... tightening control of the state over them in the guise of protecting them you know it's for your own safety it's for your own betterment we will we will be there we will take care of you in this tough time let us do what we're here to do and everyone will allow it to happen and so I was one of the first people to stand up on October 7th when the massacre happened in Israel uh, a few hours later I recorded a video and talking about what has just happened and what I'm thinking about it. And it was that the Israeli government has actually allowed this to happen. I mean, the, the state, the, the, the security forces, the intelligence forces, they've enabled this because there is no chance from my experience and my knowledge that something like this can happen in a natural way. <clears throat> and, you know, I, still may be wrong, but all the proofs that have been gathered until today since then are showing us that I was probably right and they knew about it and they chose or chose not to act or just simply did not act. I don't know the reason exactly why I have my speculations, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. The, the point is that If indeed in this case and in many other cases in Israel's history and in the history of humanity in the modern history of humanity this is the pattern that is happening again and again that a state or a government would allow horrible things to happen to their people 
because they have zero value to human lives, in my opinion. <laughs> they care about many other things, but not about human lives. Then if this is the case, and that's the pattern, then history is full of such examples of where things will happen around the world. We would think that they are happening with no connection to... To our government or to the state or to the higher powers above that, the global powers above that, we would think that it's just a coincidence or a malintent where really these things are all planned and are happening because someone has an interest in starting wars or starting tough periods where they want to clamp down on human rights and and create a different order or a different, you know, structure in the country. And they need the cooperation of the people in order to bring this change about. And the easiest way to create change is by enrolling the people into the reason of why we need that change. And so when you do something like October 7th, obviously most of the people of Israel would go, Yeah, bring on the war. They just massacred 1,400 people, including children and everything in, in, in our country. Let's, let's go in and wipe out Gaza. You know, that it, becomes, it becomes like a, a, an okay thing to say. Whereas if you said that a week earlier, it would sound a little bit crazy. Like, why would I go, go out there and, and wipe out an area of like 2 million people. How, how is that even possible, right? So that becomes a possibility that you can actually think about a week later because of what happened, right? So, yeah. So that's my view, unpopular mm -hmm. view, but... Po popular for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That, and, and you also mentioned something very interesting that you said like 70% uh, of the people uh, the, in this example that you gave were in favor or are in favor of, of another war, uh, which also makes me uh, question to, to the original question, coming back to that question. Um, do you think when we have a Bitcoin standard, let's, let's make this example of like, there is no central banks. Um, governments have to basically... Uh, For everything they are doing, they have to raise taxes. Uh, they have to get uh, people to to pay for for the government services. So there's a completely different world when when you cannot uh, just print money. And we all use Bitcoin like in a utopian world. Would that um, stop wars, or do you think uh, they will just be different because people will still have those conflicts and it's human nature to, to have those conflicts? I think it will not stop wars entirely. First of all, to, to, your, um, to the landscape that you're portraying where on a Bitcoin standard we may not have central banks, then obviously I pray with you that one day the whole institution of central banking will be abolished. However, I'm not sure that that would happen because I think that maybe we are entering a stage where the governments or the states will understand the value of Bitcoin so well that they would be relatively quick to adopt Bitcoin as treasury. And the treasury will then have, I mean, the central bank will have some role with managing the treasury, I think. So maybe the, the, the roles and the functions of the central banks will change. I don't know if they will be completely abolished. Um, but we may witness an era or an epoch at which central banking is holding reserves and there is no more fractional reserve, but there is like full reserve, you know, like, They, they lend the money out to the banks, the commercial banks at a one-to-one -one ratio and not a fractional reserve. And maybe that will solve some of the problems. And so I think we are going to see a gradual, wherever it's going to play out, however it's going to play out. I'm not an economist. I don't have like enough knowledge and experience to know or to speculate on how exactly this will play out. But whatever way, whichever way, I think we will see a gradual period of change in which the power that the banks and the central banks hold will decrease slowly. And while 
this change will take place, we will see an era that good behavior or a positive impact on society will be incentivized where today it's not being incentivized so much. Even when there is an emphasis on doing good in the world, like doing a po- putting a positive impact on the world in the corporate world today, which is the world I come from, it's called corporate responsibility. You want corporations or companies to develop some kind of corporate responsibility and decide what topics or what areas they are taking upon themselves in order to bring a positive change in the world, whether it's the environment or social justice of some kind kind or a cause like they are incentivized in a way to to participate in this game but that game is completely flawed as well because the ones that are setting the rules for that game are the globalist powers of the world economic forum or the un dictated by the um uh, sdgs this um this uh, forgot the s the the development goals of the un sdg stands for S development goal. I forget what the S stands for. You can check it up on Google, but um, sustainable development goals. That's it. Okay. Sustainable development goals. So each, each company or corporation that wants to participate in this game is taking part in adopting some of these sustainable development goals and deciding that now they are implementing like an ESG uh, structure ESG stands for environmental social governance, right? So you're bringing in climate agenda. Climate is the environmental part or LGBTQ, which is a social agenda into your company or corporation, which may be a private company. And you're not, you don't have to do it because it's a private company. You can do whatever the fuck you want as a CEO of a private company. But you take on that because there is an incentive structure, because you are being told that if you don't implement ESG in your company, you may not receive funding from investors anymore. Investors want to invest in companies that develop a corporate responsibility that is backed by ESG and by SDGs and all these acronyms. So, and so, and this is like an indirect coercion mechanism that has a, re- a really flawed incentive structure. Why do I say it's coercion? Because you will simply not get money from investors, fiat money, if you don't um, create those social and, and climate related causes in your company. You may not care about these topics at all, and you just may want to focus on what your company is supposed to do, but you have an incentive to actually bring in those political and social causes into your company. And so the incentive structure today to participate in doing good is completely flawed because it's forcing you to focus on specific agendas and it's forcing you to do so in order to continue to live, to receive money from investors. And so back to your question, if we are going to live in an era where the incentive structure is changing because you're not, you're not um, stimulated by a coercion that if you don't do this, you will not get funding, but rather you have a sound money and an honest money called Bitcoin, that in order to receive it, you have have to actually do the proof of work and prove that you're giving actual value for people and for society. Otherwise you won't get you won't you won't succeed and you won't get the revenues and the and the profit that you're supposed to make. If you're not in that game of earning sound money, good money, that is not coerced by fiat that can just be created and there's abundance of it and investors can just have it and decide what to do with it and who to give it to based on all these arbitrary agendas or politics, then there is a lot more fairness in the system in a, in a very um, inherent way, like it, sort of the DNA of the system changes right? Because the money itself dictates 
the level of fairness, the level of corruption, the level of, uh, you know, the level of manipulation that you can put in. It's, it's way harder to earn Bitcoin than it is to earn fiat. You can earn fiat very easily by doing almost anything. Earning Bitcoin, I think it's going to be a different ball game. And again, I know that I'm not, I'm not a, a, an expert or, or an economist or a finan financial expert to explain this from a financial point of view. But I do know enough about marketing and creating demand and supply in a market for a good product. And really good. And I've worked in many, many product companies, right? Tech companies, product companies that have created some value proposition to the world and, and recruited a lot of customers. And so I know that if your product is not good enough or not ready or not, there are many, many vectors, many um, um, parameters that need to align in order for you to succeed in business. And so with Bitcoin, you have all of these stars that have to align, plus you have money that is more scarce, that is harder to achieve, and that you actually have to prove that you're working and giving value in order to create it. Unless you're a scammer and you're going to steal someone's Bitcoin, um, then, then it's a lot more fair. And so I think... Even if I don't know to, to paint the picture exactly of how it's going to look like, I have a, an intuition that the, real, the new reality that we will live under in a Bitcoin standard will force society to become more fair and more, um, and also more capitalistic in a way, like that the good will survive and that the good ones will, the ones that actually bring value to society will shine and succeed and and do better in in life and so there will be less room for mediocrity and less room for bubbles to be created speculative bubbles to be created i hope so too and then it's uh, uh when when we change the incentive structure i think this could even happen way before we have a bitcoin standard because when when bitcoin comes up and all those great bitcoiners hold all those uh, wealth and all those uh, um, investors, like you, you said, like uh, you don't get uh, investors' money when you don't have the ESG rules. But what if uh, all those investors are Bitcoiners because the wealth is now in, in Bitcoin? This changes the game completely. And all of a sudden, even before we have Bitcoin as a medium of exchange and unit of account, this could already flip the uh, incentive structure way earlier. Uh, way before we have a Bitcoin standard, uh, however this Bitcoin standard will look like. So I feel like the the future uh, is is very bright and uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, the next 50 years, so like from I'm now 25 till I'm 75, are uh, a great, great uh, era in, in, in all our lives. Look, that makes me really hopeful what you just said. The fact that we are building an ecosystem of startups and investors and um, innovation entrepreneurship in Bitcoin that is based on that um, basic principle of, you know, liberty, fairness, uh, um, sound money it it really makes me hopeful because you know i've i've been interviewing like you a lot of amazing people that are in this space that are either entrepreneurs or investors and and i already see the differences uh, between the fiat world the startup scene in this fiat world that i come from to the startup world of bitcoin that i'm now being exposed to and it's not only that you know, these people are, are good and have good intentions. And obviously we all have egos. So you'll get like, you know, e ego bursts here and there for, from everyone. But the fact that these people have made it their life's mission to make a change in the world through Bitcoin says a lot about them and says a lot about the way that they are and will be 
managing their portfolio of companies and their choice like their portfolio of companies for investors and their choice of investors for the startups and so it's like a game where the powers are changing and the people that are playing that game are changing and you know I've seen for so long for so many years I've seen so many entrepreneurs and CEOs of startups that are creating businesses and companies um, based on nice ideas or you know sometimes sometimes even boring or bad ideas but they get the money they get the funding because the investors have it and the money has to trickle down the waterfall of you know society of, of the economy so so the money is just there so it's going everywhere and I was like you know that this is just such a waste of money such a waste of people's time such a waste of energy and so many of these startups failed most of them failed and they don't succeed and they don't go anywhere and people experience heartache and you know, crisis is in their lives and breakdowns because of these failures, because of the broken system. And now I'm like seeing, and I'm not saying that Bitcoin startups will not fail. Obviously, some of them will fail as well. This is life. It's just, uh, it's like that. There are many reasons for a startup or a business to fail. So that will continue happening. But if the threshold is becoming higher, and I've heard, um, I think it was two days ago, I've listened to the podcast, um, one of my favorites, TFTC, um, Marty Bent is interviewing Preston Peach, two of my favorite people, listening to them speaking about the threshold for CEOs of startups today, which is about 55% that you have to show your investors that you are making um, annually. It, this is very, very high. Like in traditional startups, it's normally like 10, 12%, 15% tops, and that's high. So now for Bitcoin companies, it's like 55% because not only that you have to like win the market with your product, you, you also have to like win um, the Bitcoin yield, which is very high, much higher than fiat yield. So you have to rise up to like 55% return on investment for for um investors and that is a very big ask that is a very big task so bitcoin startups have to be much more efficient and much more productive and much more and much better at what they do than normal startups like on the fiat standard right so there is a bit, much bigger challenge for them to overcome and so if we are building right now that kind of industry that the threshold is so high, the challenge is so high, and they are successful in it, then, dude, we are building a kick-ass industry. Like, we're building a kick-ass ecosystem just based on these numbers. That is, that is phenomenal if, if we succeed in that, and I hope we do. And, I, and that's why I always say to people, smart people, good people, like whether they're in sales or marketing or product or technology, you know, development, whatever, come into the Bitcoin space. There is so much to do. It is such a young ecosystem. It's just such a young industry that needs all this talent and all the best and brightest in order to succeed. It cannot be a mediocre company. It will just not have any excuse to survive. It will fail very quickly. Okay, but if you are a very smart person, bright, sophisticated, good at what you do, even if you're in a niche, you'll find your place in the Bitcoin industry. It may be harder because there is not much money at the moment in, um, in Bitcoin startups. There is not much. Right, if I compare that to the startups, even to the crypto space, right? Crypto companies get so much more funding <laughs> than Bitcoin companies. It's ridiculous because we, both you and I know like who's going to build the better product or the more, you know, the more valuable product. But it's we're still early days, and that and people still don't get it. Like the big money is still not getting it fully, and so it takes more time for the big money to come into the tech 
ecosystem and the tech industry, but it will happen. And I think it's starting to happen. And so that's why I tell like good friends around me that come from the tech industry, start building your own startup or start thinking about integrating into an existing Bitcoin startup because you're going to do really well because this is going to be, this is a game changer. Um, yeah. So I'm very hopeful and I love the I love thinking about what the Bitcoin ecosystem, tech ecosystem would look like in the next few years, not just life, not just, you know, war and peace, but also innovation and entrepreneurship. I think that will flourish under a Bitcoin standard. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup your security setup and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Yeah, and it's uh, it's so interesting for me because when when you think about someone who wants to invest in a Bitcoin only startup, he has to be a Bitcoiner. Like uh, there's probably no way around that. Um, and he, as a Bitcoiner, he ha holds probably a lot of his wealth in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin itself mm -hmm. is quite a, a rising star. So you have to have an incentive to bring on an extra headache because investing in a startup is not just like, yeah, put my money there. You, you have to care for that startup uh, a little bit. Uh, most uh, early investors, startup investors are active and not involved, just like, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're involved. Mm -hmm. So this uh, keeps up the hurdle rate extremely, which also brings up the quality of those startups. If a Bitcoin startup survives for a, a few years, this says way more than when a crypto or fiat st startup survives for a few years because it's way harder to survive in, in the Bitcoin landscape, which uh, improves the overall quality. And that's that's something uh, am amazing to, to witness. Uh, one question, uh, because you mentioned uh, your podcast, and I think this is always like, learning from other bitcoiners learning from other people in general is is such an a uh, great honor to have and you already have so wow. many great podcasts um what is uh what would you say is your biggest learning or your like the the one takeaway that you have now from this i don't know what was it 40 episodes something around almost. that almost almost 40 episodes what was your like the, the biggest takeaway uh, that you had from that i had a thousand takeaways it's like almost after every episode my mind is like blowing with like damn you know how in the matrix they plug it in they plug neo in in order to to learn new things <laughs> I know jiu-jitsu. It's like that. Like when I finish when I finish an episode it's like 
damn, I just learned all that stuff about whatever, you know, investments or... Yeah, so, you know, one of the... Um, I'll, I'll just say a few because it's hard for me to pinpoint one big takeaway, right? So when I did the episode with uh, Mark Moss, I think I understood how you can be, and this is like, it's funny because it's not related to like money or Bitcoin, but it's related to like life. I, I understood how you can be a really successful entrepreneur and small business on your own and keep your modesty and being a real human being. And I mean, Mark for me is such a, an inspiration, an example of someone that is constantly like teaching people and giving them from his knowledge and his expertise. Um, very generous and still stays with like both feet on the ground. Very, very humble, very like, eye level, like you can start a conversation with him and straight away feel like any question you would ask would be a good question or the right question to ask. Like you'd feel very at home with who you are around him. And many of my guests had that trait, like Larry Lepard, for example, you speak to him, like you ask a question, he validates you straight away. Like you get the right, like, like you ask the question, he goes, Right, right. I yeah, I have the same question. And then he starts answering you. So it's like when you speak to people that you find that they are so humble and good to you, no matter what your level of understanding he is, or no matter what where you come from, what your background is, where you're from, who you are, they're just simply kind, welcome and and welcoming and 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 nice you just realize that you know good and kindness exists in the world and not all successful people have to be you know this snobbish um really condescending superior people and i think that that's one thing that really is important for me in life in general that people stay humble because I think that one of the core reasons for the hardship and the, the conflicts and, you know, the suffering, the pain and the wars that we see in the world is a superiority, is the fact that we think that we are better than other people and that we are superior in one way or another and that we don't see the unity. We don't see how we are all the same, really. Yeah, so one has more knowledge than another, one has more expertise in something than another, but in the end of the day, we're all human beings. We have the same characteristics, we have the same DNA, we have the same, you know, we have a lot of potential. Some of us discover that potential more than others, but we are all humans and we can all benefit from each other if we learn how to be kinder and, and be better to each other and to ourselves. And in some, in some surprising, uh, bizarre way, I feel like the Bitcoin industry has a larger concentration of <laughs> those characteristics than other groups in the society. And so it makes me very happy and very hopeful and very um, motivated to keep doing what I'm doing and to by then inspire other people to do what they want to do as well. Because I show them that you can you know, be smart and successful and, um, and maybe, you know, funny and wise and still keep a very open mind and kind heart and open heart. And so Mark Moss was one that gave me that. And Larry, as I said, Peter St. Ange, um, you know, Eva, so many of my, of my guests, obviously Jeff Booth, <laughs> <laughs> and even Michael Saylor, when, you know, you interviewed him as well. And when I interviewed him, like the first question I asked him, he answered me in such a graceful manner with, with an analogy straight away. But the way he answered, just his energy and communication, if you take a look at that, at that episode, you'll see that th that's the first question I ask him. And he answers in such a theatrical way as if he 
actually cares and invests in how he is delivering the message, not just the message itself, because you and I both know that Michael had been interviewed hundreds of times by hundreds of people. And oftentimes he is being asked the same questions <laughs> again and again and again, right? Because, you know, as much as we are talented, we still come up with similar questions because we want to know similar things. And the fact that he is able to kind of recruit himself again and again and again and bring out that enthusiasm and excitement and, you know, dynamism in the way that he answers that makes all the difference that it shows that he really cares. It shows that he's really having fun. And, and that I don't take that for granted. So, you know, I, I think, you know, so I think in the end of, in the end of this long speech, I did give you just one thing, which is like people's kindness in communication and people's gracefulness in being with another person that really teaches me more humbleness, more modesty, and gives me inspiration to be who I am and to continue giving to other people. Yeah, this comes, I, th I think Jeff Booth said that, that Bitcoin is an ego killer. I think he also has less ego death capital. Uh, and it's, it's, it's such an uh, amazing way to, to look at it because you, you get humbled uh, along the way so many times, or you try to find, you fix Bitcoin, you invest in some shit coin, and then all of a sudden, oh, Oh, that was that was not bad in Bitcoin, and there are so many small uh, avenues where you go through, and then you know, oh yeah, Bitcoin humbles me again. So yeah, it's 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 great to have have those things, and I think also the Bitcoin community itself. Like I came as a, a stock pro and crypto pro into the Bitcoin Twitter uh, realm, and Bitcoin Twitter made me do a Bitcoin maxi. Like Twitter, wow, Twitter, really? Twitter humbled me. Uh, I just got so much feedback from my tweets, and you can look back like the last two two and a half like five years or something like that all my tweets are public i never deleted anything so you can actually look through my history of of getting from a stock pro to a bitcoin maxi uh which is fascinating i also had some small shitcoin thing there but that's actually not that public on on on, on twitter because i <laughs> kept it to myself for the most part because bitcoin twitter was like really pushing uh and yeah hum that not only Bitcoin itself, but also Bitcoin community, I feel like is is very cool and, and very um, humbling uh, to begin with. Um, I have seen one thing in, uh, I always am curious what, what people write in their own bios and how they describe their things. And you have two things uh, written in, 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 the, in the bio that uh, is not directly related to, to, to uh, Bitcoin. And I want to ask you, what are the connections there and, and what's the importance for you there? The first thing is health. You, you, you put uh, the word health in there. What's the connection for you? Uh, from Bitcoin and health? And do you think like a sound monetary system is also then incentivizing a sound uh, body, a sound uh, uh, spirit and a sound health uh, in general? Right. I don't remember the exact wording I used there on the bio related to health. What did I write? Um, I think, I think uh, on your podcast link tree, there's just like health written, like uh, mm, there's like uh, money. That's right. Uh, ah, okay, now I get it. It's written that. as one of my topics. Yeah. So when I when I introduce my podcast, I say my podcast is called You're the Voice. And it's not just a Bitcoin podcast. It's a podcast about health and politics and the changes that the world is going through, digitalization, mind control, health, you know, climate. I cover many, many topics and obviously money and Bitcoin. And I cover a lot more money and Bitcoin lately um, since I, I'm deeper into it. But health is a super important topic for me. First of all, because I started my awakening process, spiritual and informative awakening process uh, during COVID in 2020, I think 2020, 2021, where I experienced personally um, a very hard time because I chose not to participate in the genetic experiment that was running around the world. 
And actually, it was more than a genetic experiment. It was a social experiment and a psychological experiment on, on the world, on the world society that people don't really understand. And they still think that COVID was a health event. And it was not a health event. In fact, there was no pandemic. If you look at the numbers and you are a critical thinker and you're, you go and you check things rather than trusting an expert, you go and you validate yourself. And that's what I've done during COVID. I became like a health fanatic uh, in a way because I, I went to do my own research on health and to understand what is this mayhem and why do they want me to do things to my body that I may not want to do, not for myself and not for my son. And I decided not to participate in this uh, experiment. And I, th this was the, one of the best decisions of my life, but not just because of a health perspective, but because it helped me wake up to a lot of the lies. I wouldn't be in Bitcoin if it wasn't for health, right? So my way, my rabbit hole into Bitcoin started with COVID, started with health, starting to see the broken incentive structure, the way that doctors are behaving because of the incentive structures that they have towards the government, towards the Ministry of Health, towards the World Health, Health Organization, like all this structure of politics that is built around our health, that is trickling down and impacting our individual lives in such a sophisticated way And the thing that helped me wake up to it was my experience as being a marketeer, just seeing the marketing campaign that started taking place during COVID on how they are brainwashing people's minds into believing that, first of all, that there is the end of the world pandemic and then that the vaccinations are the best solutions out of it, right? Again, the problem reaction solution and seeing a propaganda forming so that, that like I started investigating. And so a lot of my early interviews on my podcast are related to health and are with doctors and researchers and, and people that are heavily involved into the COVID uh, uh, period and still are doing a lot in order to experience, uh, sorry, in order to um, expose Uh, the lies of the COVID uh, era. And at one point when the government and the state came so hard and violated my, my bodily autonomy and my rights over my health and my body, I then understood that the next thing they're going to do is to violate in the same way my property rights and my rights over my money and what's mine. And so I decided to start learning about money. And that's how I, I didn't transition, but I just added to my portfolio, the topic of money and economies and um, financials and Bitcoin. Um, I mean, Bitcoin was the solution that I found down, down the track, but I started with investigating money out of investigating health. And so I continue to talk about health because I believe I mean, my, my big thing in my podcast is sovereignty and how to push people to discover sovereignty in their lives, whether it would be in their health or in their financials or in their nutrition or in their uh, environment with the climate and everything, like just finding sovereignty everywhere so you can become a sovereign human being and reclaim the power that you have given away to different entities, like reclaim that and take ownership and responsibility over your, your life. And so with health, we have completely given away our decision-making processes and our, um, our judgment to other people, whether it's doctors or the state to decide things for us. And so I push people to reclaim their sovereignty over their health, just the same way I push people to, or not push, encourage people to reclaim their sovereignty over their financials and, and, and be introduced into Bitcoin. So yeah, health is super important. I am a big advocate for natural health and um, I have completely stopped consuming any pharma product since 2020 not even paracetamol, not even Advil, nothing like zero. I started using uh, etheric, etheric um, 
oils and natural oils and and mushrooms, so both psilocybin mushrooms for microdosing and um, and mushrooms without psilocybin just as a nutritional um, additive, so different types of mushrooms that are just amazing for different things. Um, vitamins, vitamin C in its raw form, uh, vitamin D, like, so I'm, I'm very much into natural health. Um, and, and it's not something that I do. I just consume it. I learn it. I read a lot about it. I treat myself and my family if they allow me or, or my, my son uh, in this way. And I think that that's amazing because, um, yeah, I've, you know, just this is for your female listeners. I don't know how many you have, but for example, birth control, like that's something we're all conditioned to think that it's so normal and okay to just take and I've been I've been taking birth control pills for like 20 years and my body completely forgot the female cycle how to create that cycle the menstrual cycle on its own and so when I got off those pills my body was like all over the place it didn't know how to do it on its own because it was so relying on external hormones to do it for it so i had to work in like reeducating my body on how to create that menstrual cycle <clears throat> again so i did that using mushrooms and and i managed to to succeed but it's not easy to teach your body again to walk on its own like to reclaim that sovereignty. So, yeah. So I think, you know, that's, that's what I care about. I care about people, um, taking sovereignty back to their own hands, whether it's health or financials or any other topic. That's, uh, that's amazing. It's also, um, I, I just looked it up, uh, because I'm curious, like it's, it's, it's slowly, slowly, uh, creeping up my female listeners quote. I think it was like, uh, when I started, like, uh, like, I think the first time I looked at the statistics was like four months ago, and then it was like 3% or something like that. That's it. That, that was really low. And now it's like seven, eight percent. So it, it's slowly, <laughs> slowly getting better. So, you uh, know, Robin, the more female guests you bring, the more female audience you'll have. Because exactly, a lot yeah. of the, a lot of my, my, my audience is almost 50, 50. It's like wow. around, yeah, 40, 40, 60, I think. Just because I am a woman and because, you know, women can identify with women more easily, just like men can identify with men more easily. And so it's, it's like a natural thing. There is no magic in it. And so I think that the more and since I talk a, about, a lot about like manly topics like money, then I do have a lot of male audiences relatively speaking. I believe that if I wouldn't speak about money, I'd have a lot more females and males listening to my podcast. But I think that now, you know, my audience will be exposed to your podcast when I share it. And a lot of my female audiences will go, okay, I want to learn more about money. I want to learn more about Bitcoin. This guy is producing. And for my female audience, if you don't know, Robin is producing like mega quantities of <laughs> content <laughs> and interviews how many it's like one a day or what what is it yeah it's it's one a day and Crazy. i'm uh, i think 215 or 20 now yeah that, there you go so it's like my my female audience would go okay if i want to go deeper this is a good source for me and so i sh i can definitely use robin and so i think that the 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 only thing we have to cross is the first hurdle when you um, intuitively are drawn to someone because of their sex or because of their the way they look or because something else that draws you in, their energy or whatever. But once you're in and you cross that hurdle, you discover that a certain topic interests you or a certain person interests you or whatever. I know so many of my audiences have been thanking me and like writing to me in in person to tell me thank you for introducing all these interesting people to them that they can then go and continue learning from later so that's like a to me this is an awesome contribution that i can then con help them continue their journey their learning process with other people that's great because i don't have all the answers and i i am not 
you know, I, I'm just like one source. You want to, when you want to learn, you want to, you want to do it from various people. And so I think, yeah, it's great if you bring more women. And I think in the Bitcoin space, there are so many talented women that are not getting center stage, but not because people don't want to invite them, but because of the nature of women, that they're a little bit more shy and they don't push themselves. And so they may be less seen and they don't position themselves as experts in something. There is a like an innate, an innate, like a, a natural sense of... Uh, modesty it's not humbleness it's modesty in women because they oftentimes don't think that they're worth right it's like self-worth thing with women so they don't even imagine they it doesn't even cross their minds to write something in their bio that would make people approach them to ask them to be interviewed or come to speak at an event right they will just like write something that will be very vague or, you know, their tweets will be about things that are happening out there and not necessarily their own opinion or something that, that they want to push. So women are generally less good at promoting themselves. I see men. Can, can, I, can I share something funny with you about that? Please, please. Yeah, you know, when I interviewed Sailor, <laughs> I thought that what would happen after this interview is that I'd get like, shitloads of male followers that love sailor right and i did get a slight increase in follower base it, it was nice like i did get more followers especially on youtube it was nice a lot of them criticized me whatever like male love to criticize they were like why is she nodding all the time or stop talking when he's you know i hardly spoke at this interview i was so quiet whatever so i got a lot of criticism i, I got some male audiences new male audiences but the one thing i got the most was males guys approaching me to ask me to interview them after the sailor interview and that was in a totally different proportion or ratio to what i have received before so I have the podcast even before and I was, you know, interviewing like really cool people like Samson and Jeff and, you know, uh, and Eric Case and whatever, like a lot of good people. But after Sailor, it's like all these guys lining up, knocking on my door. Can you interview me as well? Can you interview me as well? Can you interview me as well? It's like almost every day. And I'm like, what happened, guys? Like you saw that I interviewed Sailor and now I'm like interesting enough to interview you like you want to be on the same platform where sailor was what is it and the funny thing was which is which is legitimate it's fine it's good that they're doing it but not even one woman approached me to ask the same thing they could have i know many women in this space they did not approach me only the guys approached me why are they shy or do they not think that they're worthy do they not want to promote themselves what is it so you know it's an interesting statistic i think to to realize how much more uh, courage and confidence men have to go out there and put themselves out there and say hey i'm interesting enough can you put my voice out there i want my voice to be out there but women would not do it not in the same proportion so yeah so i encourage all women to approach all podcasters and tell them that you want to be interviewed. It's fine. You can do it. <laughs> That's so interesting. I never looked at that, but I can 100% uh, confirm that <laughs> because um, I'm, uh, I'm taking often uh, people on that have no following at all. Uh -huh. uh, like I have uh, even I had one guy on, he just wrote me a lot of really interesting YouTube comments, like really that long. And I just like invited him and, and then he was on the podcast uh, because I found his replies were really meaningful and deep and long and, and really cool. So I have a lot of, um, let's call them no names, like not popular names on my show. So 
now it gets more and more known that I do that. And now I get a lot of uh, people that have n not, no following at all that yep. just write me randomly. Hey, can I, I have this amazing story? Can I be interviewed? Like I get this almost on a daily basis now. I, I get it on a weekly basis, I would say. And I never realized there was not one woman doing that. And I get it so there often. There you go. I, there I get, you go. And and obviously after Sailor the the rate was increased of that I, I can also attest to that, um, uh, but yeah it's it's like it's funny like a, a, a man can can say like oh Sailor was interviewed on that I have no following I did not write a book I did not write a single article on Bitcoin like there's people out there <laughs> that have not written one single piece of on Bitcoin, and and then like hey I I saw the Sailor interview I, 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 I also want to be interviewed. <laughs> And it's fine for me. Like I, for example, one guy approached me and it will be published soon. And I, he said like, Hey, I'm this teacher. I, I want to share this story. And I was like, really cool. I would like to do it, but uh, I need to have something. And then he went on, I created a YouTube channel and made a, a YouTube video over one hour long talking about Bitcoin. And I watched the video and I was like, oh, that's really good. Like he, he just created four application for my podcast. Amazing. That's uh, amazing. So that, that's amazing. Yeah. So, but it, yeah, I can totally attest to that. Like in, uh, not one, like every single uh, woman that was on my show, I approached yep. and uh, around probably 10 to 20% of the men that are on my show approach me. Like this is, I think not a lot of people know that. Exactly. Like, even bigger ones, like even ones yeah. with like 30, 40,000 uh, followers, they're like, Hey, I have a new book. Do you want to interview me? <laughs> so, exactly. So like, I, I get that from male. F females don't do that. Exactly. So that's, and, and, you know, I've been teaching for the past nine years, I've been teaching people personal branding, how to build their own brand. And I still do it today. I do it mostly to organizations that invite me to teach their employees or their management or whatever. And the first thing I say when I start teaching them is drop your humbleness or shyness or modesty. It is not the time for it. I mean, it's okay that you continue to be humble in your life, but when you want to build a brand, when you want to be known for something, when you want people to approach you with suggestions, with opportunities, with business opportunities, with personal opportunities, how the fuck would people know what you want in life if you don't put yourself out there? They are not reading your mind. They are not in your head. They do not know what your life looks like. We are so self-centered that we think that the world knows stuff about us. People know nothing. People are so egocentric. They just care about themselves and they focus on themselves and they don't really bother to get interested in other people's lives unless it's really close friends or family. So most people don't know. If you want them to know something about you, if you want to promote something, if you want to get a new job offer, if you want a new project, if you want a collaboration, if you want... You're, if you want more followers, you want more people to know who you are and what you do, you have to do work. The work is to first build your identity as a brand, your, your brand identity, and then to start creating content and put it out there. If you don't put it out there, no one will know. And the way to put it out there is diverse. There are so many ways that you can do that. And one of the ways is, yeah, go on podcasts, you know, write a book, write an article. There's uh, so many things you can do today. This is like endless. Do a little meetup, whatever, but start building yourself. And if you don't do the work, no one will know. And then you'll sit there and you'll go, mm, why this thing that I want to achieve in life? Why is this not happening? Like, why isn't the world bringing me what I want to have happened? You have to take action. You have to be active about it. You have to start putting yourself out there. There is no room for modesty when you want to promote your brand. So, uh, women, one, wake, wake up. up. <laughs> and and it's so um, it, it it's not it's not easy, I would say. But there, there's like a clear pathway, and you just have to do the work for that. And it's yeah. it's really also like just saying yes to all opportunities. Like I was. 
uh, I get also a little bit more invited now to other podcasts. I never asked another podcaster to be on, on a, a show uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, it never crossed my mind that I actually do that. Uh, but I have been on some other podcasters who approach me but those podcasters are very small like uh, some like some actually like i think three of them started their podcast with me like i was their first episode um and i have this thing where i just say yes to everything like i just like say yes to opportunities uh even though uh, in the end of the day it might turn out to be a waste of time but i think there is no such a thing of waste of, like it's just like oh yeah i, I spend their time but i could have invested other things but maybe that would have led to something way bigger as led to mm -hmm. something amazing so like i just try to say yes to almost everything uh that, that i can do uh, which also now <laughs> filling up my calendar quite a lot but but that's a that's a luxury problem to have um and just like saying yes to opportunities and i say that because um, when I approach women to be on my podcast, I get way more often asked like, oh, why me? <laughs> I, I think not as seriously. Single, yeah. Like, wow. uh, women, I was like, why? Because I approach uh, people also that have not a big following. So like, People that have a big following don't question why you want me on a, on a podcast, like they, because they have been on so many other podcasts. Yeah. It's, it's natural, but but I have uh, people on the podcast. There is like your know, their first podcast or their second podcast or the fifth podcast, uh, and and then they see like oh they see my channel and like the first thing that pops up is Sailor, and then they see like Jeff Booth and ten thousand uh, views and thirty thousand views and fifty on oh, Sailor has like hundred fifty or something like thousand views. And then they are intimidated and they're like, oh, wh wh why me? Like, wh why am the chosen one? And I'm like, yeah, because you wrote that one article that I saw and it was really interesting. Or you, you made that one appearance there and I thought it was really interesting and I just wanted to talk with you and I want to record that. Like, <laughs> why? <laughs> like, that, that's pretty obvious why. So, But I get that. Uh, I don't know. If, there's probably like one, two guys that also said, why me? But uh, it's, it's very, <laughs> it's like mostly they, they, women. It, it's mostly women. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, yeah. Awesome. Now think this, we're talking about podcasts. Now take it one step further and think about public speaking. That's even harder, right? Podcasting is even easier. When you, when you say to a woman, go stand on a stage and speak or be on a panel or approach this event organizer and pitch yourself to speak about something, or they would go like, what? You're crazy. Like me? What do I know? Who am I? Blah, blah, blah. And the men would just go, bring it on. <laughs> yes. Where do I sign up? <laughs> Most men, obviously, we're generalizing, but yeah, yeah. it's like convincing women to pitch themselves to speak at events is hard. They are very scared. Yeah, I think uh, I have one hundred percent that that minds of like f just for example, if if uh, a Bitcoin conference asks me to do it, hey, can you be tomorrow at the stage for like two thousand people, and I'm like. Oh, yes, <laughs> I have no clue what I'm talking about, but uh, you ask me and I will do it because it's a exactly. ma massive opportunity. I will just not sleep till tomorrow, figure exactly. out what I'm talking about, uh, put some slides on there and, and will do my best job possible. Uh, yeah, but I think uh, when it comes to a stage, also like more more males will be more uh, frightened. But I think yeah, that's it's a general thing uh, where where I see it also in, in in the podcasting. But yeah, and oftentimes women wait to be invited uh, instead of taking the initiative and pitching themselves. So yeah, and and I understand that as a like a, it's a natural thing. But you, as I said, it's like you need to go one step back and think about your goals, your business goals, your personal goals, your goals in life, where do you want to reach? And if a certain platform will promote that goal for you, then you have to, you have to take it. You have to do things. You have to take action and being on a stage, being in a podcast, writing something, I don't know, collaborating with someone, these are the ways to do it. So you gotta, women have to start thinking more in that very goal oriented way in order to progress in life. And yeah.
I just realized that we're already uh, recording for almost one, one hour, 20 oh minutes. Oh my God, it's like this. <laughs> it was like really quickly. Uh, I had one topic in my mind that I really wanted to cover, but uh, I think we will leave it for maybe another, okay. year, another time because CBDC is also really interesting and you made a, a presentation also yes. in Prague around that. Uh, but we already had so many interesting topics and we have an end routine of, uh, with, with two questions. The one question is always the same question for every guest. Um, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about in the episode? Spirituality. So I am, um, yeah, I, I love, I love um, understanding the human from other angles. Um, my natural draw to marketing was because of the understanding of the human psyche and the way we think and the way we make decisions. And in marketing, I had this amazing combination of psychology and consumerism and business. And it's like in that crossroad of so many, um, so many topics like interdisciplinary area. And one of the things that I started being exposed to learning more, practicing training in my life, in my daily life since like, since I think 10 years ago, but it was very, very slow in the first six years and the last four years, it was accelerating is my spiritual um, path and my spiritual awakening. And by exposing myself more to spiritual teachers and trainers and mentors and and books and various ways i have another i have another angle or another lens to look at the human to look at myself to understand myself better and um i'm not a religious person I respect religions. I respect people who, who have faith and religion. I think that faith is, is an amazing thing because you actually get to expand your senses more than the five senses that we know. You actually learn to trust in something or put your trust in something that you cannot see or hear or feel. Actually, you can feel. That's the only thing you can. You can feel it because it's energy. And so when you start developing trust in yourself or in a higher self or in a higher source and you start connecting back to who you are, there is a whole world that opens up. And you then understand that our, that uh, I'll speak for myself, my goal in life, my purpose is to clean and clear as much as, as 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 I can of my shit that is out there, my dialogues, my limiting beliefs, etc., and reconnect back to my very um, primal gift, signature, uh, essence, purpose, who I am, why I came here, what I came here to do, what are my traits, my uniqueness that I can reconnect to. As a child, we have that very naturally like ch children you see children they're like these bubbly creatures that is very easy to determine what they're all about what their strong strong suits are their characteristics the things that you know that stand out their signature what is their signature because they're so connected to themselves there's no bullshit you know there's no there are no layers of complication of um trauma and and conditioning that have been created through the years for them they're very clean and so from round about like the age of seven to 14, this starts changing. And then from 14 onwards, it starts changing even more. And we start accumulating all these, um, all these behavioral conditioning and, and these meanings and interpretations that we give to life and to ourselves. And we start a process of distancing ourselves from ourselves. We're like separating the self from from life and so i'm in the inverse process now of like reconnecting back and coming closer in touch with myself 
and reconnecting to that child and understanding again my signature and who I am and uniqueness. And I'm not trying to invent anything new. I'm simply deciphering. It's like in crypto, right? In cryptography, I'm like deciphering my code again, like reverse engineering back to the source, to who I am, to my signature. And so spirituality really helps me in that. And so in my podcast as well, I interview some people uh, that are on the spiritual path. And I also go on a lot of uh, podcasts that are s about spirituality. And, um, and I love talking about that. I love like investigating that. And it really helps me um, do the work and, and keep like a good mental stability and spiritual stability and um and res and create resilience in my life so yeah so i that spirituality is is an aspect that most people are not familiar with i i love that question uh so much that i now g g give it every end of the podcast because it gives just something completely new and uh, the reason why i ask that question always is um because we mostly talk about Bitcoin. I mean, we talked about uh, wars, we talked about uh, female versus male things. Uh, we talked about uh, social media also, like a lot of different topics, but yeah. it gives the stage to learning something different from Bitcoiners. And I think Bitcoiners are such unique people that we can learn way more than just money from each other. A hundred percent. And my, my next episode is going to be all about spiritual awakening. So the people that are interested in that topic yeah jump over and take a look it's gonna be and, it's for dummies it's like awakening for dummies <laughs> I, i love that a lot i will ch definitely check it out cool. um perfect then let's come to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually uh, is and yours is an in really really interesting one uh, who, was, who was the last guest The last guest was Scott uh, Sibyl, Sibley. Okay. Uh, he uh, is said six years and he writes uh, kids' books and makes the Shamari. I don't know, maybe you heard about Shamari. No. Uh, the, the games where you uh, play like a memory game for kids, but yes. like in a Bitcoin way. It's, it's, really, it's wow. really cool and really nice, uh, that, cool. that game. Yeah. And uh, check so it out suiting to that uh theme of, of his and uh, him the question from him is if you could teach a kid one thing about bitcoin what would it be i actually just did that two days ago with my niece and the first thing i taught her is inflation <laughs> i taught her how money works how how fiat system works and she got it straight away she understood so that's the one thing I would teach kids. I would teach them how money is being created because then they get Bitcoin really quickly. It is also interesting because people ask me, and, and it's funny how this connects because people ask me, oh, how do you orange build? And I'm like, I asked first before I start any questioning, I asked first like, oh, what do you think about inflation? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, depending on what the answer to that question is i know where to start and if he's like oh yeah inflation is is, is good it's we need uh inflation but it should not be too high then i know oh i have to start way before bitcoin <laughs> uh, and the first like five hours is not about bitcoin it's about the financial system so exactly. it's, it's uh, inflation is the the start to that I, uh, i love that the point yeah perfect before i let you go um where can people find you ask you questions uh, and find your podcast also so i'm actually as a marketeer i'm on every social media platform so you can find me everywhere by just by typing my name including of course noster and i'm trying to build my my uh, noster follower base i've uh, i've crossed the 1k threshold so like more than 1000 followers which is very cool on noster uh, i'm on twitter That's where I have the biggest follower of like almost a hundred thousand people. Uh, I'm on Telegram. I have channels, um, channel in Hebrew and in English, and um, I have a Substack blog that you can find me. It's called You're the Voice and my name, <clears throat> and um, and my podcast, which is You're the Voice. Uh, you can find the links to it on my link tree, which is on on any social media channel. So yeah, follow me there. 
Perfect. And thank you so much, Efrat, for taking your time. Also for and for everyone watching and listening uh, uh, to us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wow.